that they may have it more abundantly. Welcome to Connecting Lives, a ministry of Sunny Crest Baptist Church located in Marion, Indiana. You know, people in today's world, just like you and I, are seeking to find a sense of importance, meaning, and joy in life. These things come from one source, our Father in Heaven through the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you seeking to be connected to the truth of God's Word? Join with us today in worship in the study of God's Word as our pastor and the fellowship of believers here at Sunnycrest help you to connect personally with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That Jesus had not actually committed any sin. He was certainly not a blasphemer, which is the accusation the Jewish religious leaders brought against him. They accused him of blaspheming against God, and he certainly did not do that. He just told the truth when he was asked questions about who he was. And that's certainly not blasphemy. It's just God bearing witness to God in that moment because Jesus is God incarnate. And so all of that has taken place. We've studied all of that. And then we get up to verse 15. The reason we kind of cut it off there last week is we're going to start looking at some of the motivations that are going on because Mark, even though he keeps everything limited as far as the amount of words he uses to describe these events, he does focus quite a bit in the 15th chapter on some of the motivations that are going on uh, behind the scenes in the hearts and minds of the people who basically orchestrated and then caused the... uh, death of Christ. And this is an execution. Uh, Don't make any mistake about it. From a human perspective, it's an execution. From God's perspective, it's a sacrifice. Uh, It's a sacrifice for sins. But in their view, it's an execution. Now, Pilate looks at this as a way to satisfy the crowd. And that's what we see in those very first words of verse 15. Being Pilate in this situation, it says, wishing to satisfy the crowd. So we know a little something about what's going on in his mind. He wants to satisfy the crowd that is now screaming for the release of Barabbas and the execution of Jesus, even though he has not been able to find any fault in Jesus at all and doesn't really believe the testimony that the Jewish religious leaders have brought against Jesus. He pretty much has dismissed that out of hand as being false. He still wants to win over the crowd as the governor He wants to be viewed by the people in a positive way. And he doesn't really care about Barabbas. He doesn't care about Jesus. He doesn't really want to crucify Jesus because he's heard some things about Jesus and some of the things that Jesus has been able to do, miraculous things. And he really has been warned by his wife as well not to have anything to do with this. And he really wants to find a way out. And as we looked at last week, he tried several different ways to get out of actually ordering the execution of Jesus. But the Jewish religious leaders blocked him at every turn and basically forced him into a position that if he doesn't execute Jesus, it's probably going to cause a riot, and that's a headache that he really doesn't want. And he doesn't care about Jesus himself, so he's willing to execute Jesus just to head off any kind of negative reaction from the crowd. So that's what we see as far as his mental motivation here. He just wants to satisfy the crowd get rid of a headache, and he sees this as a way to accomplish that. And so Pilate released Barabbas for them. So he was willing to release Barabbas back into the crowd so that he could satisfy their desire and kind of win them over, if you will. Uh, And to carry that out then, it says, after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. So at this moment, this is when uh, Jesus is scourged. This is when he's beaten. Uh, by the Romans. Uh, This is the scourging that everyone has heard so much about. This, without any doubt, weakened Jesus significantly. It was an excruciatingly painful thing to have to endure. Uh, On top of the excruciating pain, it also led to a serious loss of blood, and it also compromised a lot of the inner core of the body because it would actually shred muscle as well. And so Jesus is greatly weakened by this. Uh, And then In the process of this, as he's weakened, he's then handed over to be crucified. And so that's where we're going then as we move into verse 16. So prior to actually taking him to the place of crucifixion, after the scourging, the soldiers take him into the palace. They take him away into the palace. That is the praetorium. And they called together the whole 
Roman cohort. So they assemble all the Romans that are in that particular place that will be basically escorting or guarding Jesus as they head to the place of execution to make sure that none of his disciples try to intervene. They're not protecting Jesus from the crowd. They allow the crowd to mock and throw things at Jesus. They're just making sure that their victim arrives at the destination. They don't want any of his disciples stepping in and messing things up. And so they're assembling this escort, and while they're doing that, they take the opportunity to mock Jesus, to make fun of him to mistreat him. And so that's what they do. These are a cruel and violent people. They always have been. This is the Roman way. Uh, and so they go through this whole way of humiliating him and mocking him. So it says, they dressed him up in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on him. Let's go ahead and read all the way down through verse 20. And they began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews. They kept beating his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling and bowing before him. After they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off him and put his own garments on him, and they led him out to crucify him. So they're going to go ahead and do what they intend to do, which is to lead him to the place of execution. But prior to that, while they're assembling the escort, they spend some time basically mocking him in a merciless fashion. Uh, it's sad the way they mock him and somewhat ironic they take all the vestiges of kingship, at least from the world's perspective, such as the purple robe, the crown, the scepter, and they use those things to either abuse him or make fun of him. Uh, and they do this for quite a period of time. So this is where we have the crown of thorns placed on his head. And they do that to shame him, mocking him, uh, saying, you know, if you really were the king that you say you are, we should not be able to mistreat you in this fashion. And so they put that crown of thorns upon him, not as a badge of honor, but as a method of humiliation. And they put the robe of purple on him, and then they take it off of him, again, using that to humiliate him and demean him. And then they use the scepter, uh, something that would signify the power of the king, but rather than having him hold that symbol of power, they use it to bash him on the head. So again, everything that's being done here is being done to abuse and to mock. So they're ridiculing the Son of God. Uh, and here's the sad part and the ironic part of all of this. While they're doing this, they're doing it to the one who not only gave them life, but also keeps them alive. Because he is the giver and the sustainer of life. They're doing this to the one who is actually offering himself up as a sacrifice for sin, and not just sin, but their sin, just as much as my sin and yours. So even these people who are doing this, Jesus is in the process of offering himself as a sacrifice for the very sins they are committing against him in this moment. See, that's the sad irony of this, and they are completely unaware of what is going on here. They're completely unaware of the sacrifice that is being made so that they might be able to find forgiveness for their sins if they would repent and place their faith and trust in the one they're mocking and beating in this moment. So that's the sad irony of this moment in time. But again, you just see the cruelty of man uh, when it's unfettered by the grace of God. When God pulls back and just allows men to be as evil as they want to be, they can be extremely evil. They can be wicked and depraved. And in this moment, we see the wickedness and the depravity of man on full display as the Roman cohort torments, mocks, and tortures the only begotten Son of God. So then it says, after they're finished with this, after they go through this whole period of mockery and humiliation, then they lead him out to the place of crucifixion. So verse 21, again, Mark in his usual quick, very short style, uh, says they pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. So again, not a lot of detail, just a really quick, concise, to the point, uh, element in this sequence of events. So we have Jesus being turned over to the Roman cohort after he's been scourged. We have that Roman cohort leading him towards the place of crucifixion, to the place of execution. Uh, Jesus in his weakened state. And again, Mark doesn't tell us this, but we can read some of the other gospel accounts and add some more information into this. We know that because of the scourging and the beating, he is very weak. 
Uh, and he's really struggling to bear his cross and to carry it to the place of execution. And so they enlist someone else to carry his cross for him. And that is Simon of Cyrene. So that's where we get this information in Mark. But again, very short, concise, to the point. Mark is just kind of chronicling for us the series of events that led up to the death of Christ. Beginning back with the false accusations. Well, actually beginning back with the arrest in the garden uh, by the mob. Uh, the betrayal of Judas, the false accusations, uh, the turning over of Jesus to the Romans, uh, Pilate interacting and trying to turn Jesus loose, but not being able to because of the manipulation of the Jewish religious leaders, uh, and then the scourging, the mocking, and now the destination and the journey. So the destination being Golgotha, the journey being the road from Jerusalem out to the place of execution, and then someone being commissioned or basically forced by the Romans to carry the cross of Jesus because he's too weak to carry it himself. So then we move on to verses 22 through 24. Then they brought him to the place of Golgotha. Now this is the place of execution, which is translated place of a skull. Uh, They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. So once again, we have this really concise uh, format that Mark generally follows throughout his gospel. He's just giving us the facts, but he's giving them to us in a certain order. So we see that they finally arrived at the place of execution, which is identified as Golgotha, the meaning of that place being place of a skull. It's a place of death. Uh, There's a reason the Romans picked it too, by the way. It's a very visible place. It's a place where people can see what's going on from pretty significant distances. And it's a place that's easily visible from just about anywhere as you're coming and going into the city of Jerusalem. So this is not a secluded place. They didn't do things that way. The Romans picked very public places for their execution so that they could set examples. In other words, the idea was... We'll do these things in as painful a way as possible. We'll do them in the open where everyone is aware of what we're doing. The idea being that no one will want to go through that themselves after they see someone else going through it. And when we tell them what to do, they will do it without question so they can avoid the cross themselves. So that's the reason why they use the cross. It's probably the most excruciating way you can put a person to death. It also lingers. Many of these people would linger for days on the cross before they would die, and their agony would just increase as time went by. So they picked a method that took time and produced the most agony possible over that period of time, and then they picked public places where everyone would be aware of what happened if you crossed the Romans. In other words, if you broke the rules, this is what would happen to you. And they did it in such a way that everyone was aware of that. Uh, That's why when Jesus talks about, and my wife is great at pointing this out, uh, that he says, come take up your cross and follow me, you really need to understand what he means by that in the world in which he lived. The people understood it because that was the world in which they lived. They were uncomfortably aware of the use of the cross by the Romans. Uncomfortably aware. And they understood that the cross was an instrument of death. And so when Jesus says, come take up your cross, he says, come and die to yourself and follow me. Come and be willing to lay your life down and follow me. Leave aside your old life and live a new life by following me. They got that when Jesus talked about that. When they heard the word cross, their first thought was death. Their second thought was agonizing death. And so this is the reason. This is the reason the Romans did what they did. This is the reason they did it the way they did it. And so this is what they're doing. They're executing Jesus in a public place so everyone is aware of his execution to scare everyone else back into line. So they did offer him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. So we know that he refused that. Mark, again, very concise to the point, tells us he was offered this. He refused it. And then they crucified him. Crucified means they literally nailed him to the cross, you know. Uh, somewhere usually around in here would be considered the palm, and it would get into that bone area so that you wouldn't pull loose, and then also through his feet. And so they would nail both feet together at the base of the cross. And so he's nailed to the cross uh, in that moment then to add to his humiliation. Once again, just to drive home the point that they're in control, they're in charge in this moment. 
They then divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. So they basically took his garments, what little bit that he had left, divided it up, and then they cast lots for it so that each man would get a certain piece or some of the people there would get a certain item based on the casting of the lot. And so they divided up his clothes and basically gambled for them. Verse 25 through 26. Now this is uh, probably one of the more interesting aspects of this narrative because again, we get into some of the motivations of the people involved that Mark has spent a significant time talking about. The motivations of Pilate, the motivations and the thoughts of the Jewish religious leaders. And we're going to see that exposed again in this moment as something else was placed on the cross besides Jesus. Now it says it was the third hour when they crucified him and the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. So attached to his cross was an inscription, probably on some sort of wooden board, Attached to the cross was the charge brought against him. Now remember, the Jewish religious leaders accused Jesus of blaspheming against God. That was their accusation, that he had made a mockery of their religion and that he himself had blasphemed against the holy and righteous God of heaven. And so therefore, he was worthy of death. That was what the high priest, the charge the high priest brought against him. And that was based on his claim that he was God incarnate. And so that's that whole dynamic in those trials, all that false testimony. And then when he pinned him down and asked him the question, Jesus said, this is who I am. Because he's not going to lie about who he is. He's not going to misrepresent himself. And then the cry of blasphemy came out, and that was the charge they took to Pilate, as well as other things that Pilate didn't believe for a moment. But ultimately, uh, Pilate came to rest on this, that this is the man who's basically seditious, He's uh, basically a rebel, even though he wasn't. That's sort of the charge that Pilate sets on. And then to get his dig in against the Jewish leadership, he called Jesus the king of the Jews. Now, they're not going to like this. They're not going to like this title. They're not going to like this accusation. Uh, They're not going to like this at all. Uh, He's doing this to basically take a shot at the Jewish leadership. Now, a couple things here before we move in and look at a different passage in John to kind of get into some of the the mindset of what's going on here is the third hour is probably sometime around 9 a.m. So just keep that in mind for a moment. It tells us the beginning. It was the third hour when they crucified him. So Mark does a really good job of giving us a sequence of events, and he gives times for those events. So he tells us that in the moment in which Jesus was crucified was the third hour of the day. Now, there's been a lot of controversy through the years over what time that actually is, but I think when you really dig back into what we understand about how they told time, it would be sometime around 9 a.m., so let's just go with that. So sometime around 9 a.m. in the morning was when they crucified Jesus. That's when they actually nailed him to the cross. Now, if you want to understand more about what Pilate is doing by putting this inscription on the cross, uh, we need to look back. Uh, to John chapter 19. So I'm just going to take a quick tour, uh, I mean a quick sidetrack, just real quick, to John chapter 19. I'm going to start in verse 20, and I'm going to read down through verse 22 for you. Uh, So it says, Therefore many of the Jews read this inscription, the one that Mark just told us about, where it said, He is the King of the Jews. So therefore many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. Again, very public, Uh, so that many people would see it as they were coming in and out of the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. Uh, So John gives us a little more detail about the inscription. It wasn't just written in Latin. It was written in Hebrew and Greek also. Pilate did that so that everyone who came in and out of the city, regardless of their background, could read it. Uh, He wanted everyone to know that this was the supposed king of the Jews that he was executing. So the chief priest of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. So they want Pilate to take the inscription down and they want him to change it because this is a charge they're more comfortable with. Because again, their charge against Jesus was that he claimed to be God and that by claiming to be God, he claimed to be the king of the Jews because remember the Jews are a theocracy. Uh, Their king is God. The only reason they had human kings was because they rejected God as king back in the Old Testament, and we have the historical records of that, and they demanded a king like the other nations, and so God gave them a king like the other nations, uh, just like the other nations. He gave them Saul. 
uh, and Saul was not a very good king. He was a king like the kings of the Philistines, since that's what they wanted. That's what God gave them. But Jesus really is the king of the Jews, and so when he was questioned by the high priest, he told them who he was, and by right then, they understood that to mean that he was claiming to be God in the flesh, who is the rightful king of the Jewish nations, the king of the Jews. So they brought that charge to Pilate as part of their charge of blasphemy against Jesus, thinking that would get Pilate to execute Jesus, because he would not tolerate a person who could stand in opposition to his rule over Israel, because right now in this moment, Pilate is the earthly ruler of Israel. And so they thought that would lead to the execution, but Pilate never really bought into it. But now he takes this opportunity to get a dig in against the Jews who had blocked him from turning Jesus loose, which is what we saw last week was something Pilate really wanted to do. So instead of writing, I I, he said, I am the king of the Jews. He writes that Jesus is the king of the Jews to humiliate the Jewish leadership. Pilate answered when they asked him to change it, and this is what he said. What I have written, I have written. What he basically says to them, what I have put on there is exactly what is going to stay on there. I'm not going to change it. And of course, they didn't like that, but there's nothing they could do about it because Pilate held the power. So verse 27, back in Mark chapter 15, you get a little insight into what's going on. And again, Mark goes right back to his really abbreviated style of recording the events, just giving us a Cliff Notes version of the events. It tells us about those people who are being crucified with him. It says they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. So that's where we get those famous images. Uh, it's from the biblical account of the crucifixion of Jesus. You get those famous images where people have made paintings of Jesus hanging on the cross and then one man on one side and another man on the other because that's what happened. Jesus was not the only one being crucified that day. Two robbers were being crucified as well. Uh, and it tells us that scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with transgressors. So this was done according to the will and purpose of God to fulfill the prophetic word about the suffering Savior. And if you're interested, I'll give you the reference. It's in Isaiah 53, 12, and I'll throw it up there and I'll read it. So Isaiah 53, 12 says this, and we all know that Isaiah 53 is a messianic prophecy because it perfectly describes the agony that Jesus went through. In verse 12, it says, Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. So the gospel writers, inspired by the Spirit, understood that this was a reference to the people that were crucified with Jesus. That in order to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering Savior, Jesus had to die in the midst of actual sinners, men who had actually done things that they were being executed for that not only were wrong in the eyes of the Romans, but more importantly, the things they had done were also wrong in the eyes of God. So he was numbered and executed with actual sinners. People had committed sinful acts worthy of death. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors, talking about the thieves that he was crucified with, in which we know that he did intercede for the one who placed his faith in him and said, this man being crucified with us has done nothing wrong. So Jesus being crucified with two thieves was a fulfillment of prophecy. It was a fulfillment of what God had revealed would be the plight of the suffering Savior. The way in which he would die is described here, and who he would die with is described in verse 12. And then Mark records for us in verses 27 and 28 the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 12. Moving on then to verse 29. So it says, Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Those passing by were hurling abuse, wagging their heads and saying, Ha, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So his own people continue to mock him. His own people continue to hurl accusations against him. The people that he came to die for mock him. Even the thieves mock him. Look at verse 31 and 32. Uh, in verse 31, the same way the chief priest also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. 
Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. So Mark says, and this is not contradictory either. It's easy enough to resolve. Mark says in verse 32 that both of the thieves that were being crucified with Jesus were also mocking him as the rest of the people mocked him. Now again, this is early on in the crucifixion. So we're starting at 9 a.m. That's when he's nailed to the cross. And we're going to Hit, we're going to hit just a moment, another bookend time frame, where Mark's going to tell us something happens at noon. So this is in that nine to noon window, a three-hour window, uh, that there is something going on here, and that is the mocking of Jesus by the Jewish people. The common people are listed first. We'll go back through and look at it real quick. So those passing by, these would be the people going in and out of Jerusalem. Remember, this is in a place where everybody's going to see it as they see it. They're looking up and they're seeing this Jesus that they have seen uh, in Jerusalem teaching and preaching uh, and performing miracles. Uh, and they've heard some of the accusations that the priest have been hurling against him. One of the things that was said about him was that he said he was going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, which is not exactly what he said, uh, because what he was actually talking about was his own body. Uh, he wasn't actually talking about the temple. And so the accusation against him that was brought in those sham trials was um, exaggerated or changed. You can look at it however you want. It was either exaggerated or altered, but it wasn't exactly what Jesus says. And you can go back and you can read the interaction between Jesus and his disciples when he talks about his coming death while they're at the temple. And he uses the temple as a reference point, but he doesn't talk about the temple that's made out of stone. He was talking about the temple of his flesh. Uh, and it was pretty clear to his disciples that that's what he was talking about. And after the crucifixion and the resurrection, they were completely clear about what he was talking about in that moment. And so some of the things that Jesus said are altered in the accusation that was brought against him. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago when we looked at some of the accusations brought against him. So we see that, that that's what the people are hearing from the religious leaders. So they bought into that. And as they walk by, they see Jesus, who they recognize, hanging on the cross, dying. And they begin to join in in mocking him. And basically, if you can save yourself, then come down. All these things you said you were going to do, if you can actually do those things, then you should be able to deliver yourself from the cross and come off of it. Uh, the same way the chief priest also, they're mocking him, saying among themselves, he claimed he had the ability to save others. He claimed to have the ability to forgive sins. If he has that kind of ability, he should be able to save himself, but he cannot. It's obvious he's still hanging on this cross. He's probably been on there for an hour or so at that point. If he hasn't been able to deliver himself from the cross yet, he's not able to or he would have. So they felt completely free to just mock him and ridicule him as he's dying. In verse 32, uh, we see that the thieves even were insulting him. Now we do know, and this is why it's not a contradiction, obviously at some point one of the thieves changes his mind, right? Right? So it says here clearly that at the beginning of this process, they're both insulting him and mocking him just as the priest and the crowd are mocking him. So the thieves just join in with everyone else. But at some point, one of the thieves has a change of heart and recognizes something in Jesus that's different. Probably the way in which Jesus is suffering is unlike the way they're suffering. And he recognizes something and somehow... And we don't have everything, and that's one of the things we need to understand, especially in the Gospels. We don't have everything that Jesus said. We don't have everything that Jesus did. Even the Gospel writers themselves were clear that if they were to try to record everything that Jesus had said and done while he was here on earth, they didn't have enough paper to write them down. There were not enough books to hold everything they would have to write to capture all the things that Jesus had done and taught. And so what they give us are the things the Spirit of God determined that we should have. So they were inspired to write the things that we would need. Uh, maybe in heaven we'll get to hear everything that Jesus said and did while he was here on earth. I'm sure we probably will. We'll have plenty of time. But until then, we don't have that much time. And that's what they were getting at. So we don't know everything that went on between Jesus and the other thief on the cross. Uh, people will, and I've heard, I've even heard preachers say this, the only, thing that Jesus, the only things that Jesus said while he was hanging on the cross are recorded in Scripture. And we don't know that. We absolutely do not know that. As far as we know, there might have been a five-minute conversation between the thief 
who eventually comes to faith in Christ and Jesus while they're dying on the cross. Uh, we don't know what happened because it's not in our Bible. But just because it's not in our Bible doesn't mean it didn't happen. It also doesn't mean it did happen. Again, there are some things that we just don't know because they're not recorded. But we do know, and this is why it's not contradictory, we do know that at one point, both the thieves are insulting and mocking Jesus. And later on, one of the thieves has a change of heart and goes from mocking to believing and then telling the other thief, you really should stop mocking this man. You really should. So that's a big change. Uh, but Mark does tell us that at least at the beginning, they joined with everyone else in insulting him. Verse 33, then, we get our time change. So this is verse 33. And this is our last verse tonight. I got uh, just to talk about this for a moment because Mark does a really good job of mapping out the sequence of events for us. And he also gives us a time frame so that we can know uh, the, the windows in which things happen. So when we get to the sixth hour, which would be three hours later, so if the third hour is 9 a.m., the sixth hour would be noon. Uh, when the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land. We get another time frame because we know that darkness over the whole land lasted until the ninth hour. So we have this sequence from 9 a.m. to noon and then from noon to 3 so he gives us this sequence of hours, a total of six, uh, from the time in which he's nailed to the cross to the time in which the darkness comes, which is three hours, and then three more hours, the darkness lasts. And he tells us the darkness covers the whole land. Now there's, again, a lot of dispute on, if was that a worldwide event or was that a land event as far as the nation of Israel? Did it just blanket Israel or did it blanket the whole world? And the short answer is we don't know. Again, it's, it's kind of vague. Whole land could be either the whole world or it could just be an isolated regional section. More than likely, it was probably just an isolated regional section. Uh, and the darkness may have been just over the area of Jerusalem. It may have been over the whole area of Israel. Or it may have been over that whole section of the earth. But either way, it's a darkness. And it can't be an eclipse because an eclipse doesn't last three hours. So it can't be a natural occurrence. You can't blame it on an eclipse because eclipses only last a short period of time. They certainly don't last three hours. Uh, and it's not really possible based on the laws of nature. So this is a miraculous act of God where God contradicts the laws of nature that he established uh, when he established the world. He contradicts that and that's what miracles are. So this is a miraculous event where God causes the darkness for three hours. Um, and there's some really interesting uh, commentary I want to share and this one is one of my favorites. Uh, I, I like to read, you know, a lot. You know, I like to read a lot. So when I'm reading and I'm studying, I, I read commentaries just to, you know, keep me out of left field, make sure I'm not going way too far off, you know, out into left field and, and getting lost in the weeds. So that's what commentaries are good for. They usually pull you back. But every once in a while you read one, it's just a really good way of expressing something. And, and I just, this is not scripture, but I love the way in which uh, this is expressed. So let me kind of read it to you, and I'm just going to read out of the commentary about these events and what's going on and why it's going on. So it says, there was a thick darkness over the whole land. Some think over the whole earth for three hours from noon till three of the clock. When you tell this is an old writer, this is, I think this is Matthew Henry. I forgot to write down who it was. It's pretty sure this is Matthew Henry. Uh, now the scripture was fulfilled, and I love his, his recognition of the fulfillment of scripture. Amos 8, 9, so much of what happens to Jesus on the cross, which is, unless he's God, completely beyond his control. The only way any of this could be under the control of Jesus is if he's God, uh, because a, just a man could not control these things. So Jesus would not be able, as just a man, to control these types of things in order to fulfill what the prophetic word said, going back to being crucified with two thieves. Once he's turned over for execution, if he's just a man, he has no control over where he's going to be executed, how he's going to be executed, and who he's going to be executed with. Now, if he's God, that's a different story, right? Which, again, the crucifixion of Jesus just proves that he's God incarnate, fulfilling the plan of God for all from all eternity. So the scripture was fulfilled. Amos 8, 9, I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. God promised this would happen. That he would darken the sun at noon. What time is it? Mark says it's noontime. 
Jeremiah 15, 9, her son has gone down while it is yet day, speaking of the Jewish people. Uh, and I don't think here he's talking about the sun in heaven. What he's talking about is what this darkness signifies. It signifies something much greater. And I know through the years I've read this and I've thought a lot about the symbolism of some of the things in the crucifixion, as well as the fulfillment of prophetic words. Uh, and you go back to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah talked about the death of Israel, uh, the suffering of Israel, the chastisement of Israel because of her rejection of God. Uh, and just love the tying in of Jeremiah 15, 9 with the fulfillment of Amos. He says, the Jews have often demanded of Christ a sign from heaven. That was something they demanded all the time, wasn't it? Hey, prove to us that you're the son of God. Show us a sign that we cannot deny. And I'll tell you, sadly, do we not hear that cry this day as well? Do you not hear young people saying, hey, if God's there, why doesn't he show us something that we cannot deny? My question is, what would God show you that you couldn't deny? Hasn't he shown you enough? And really, who needs to show who something? Does God really owe you a sign? Does God really need to show you something? Or do you need to show God something? Who has something to prove? Jesus didn't have anything to prove. If you think about all the miracles he had already done, all the blind people he had restored sight to, all the lame people who are running around Israel now on their own two feet, all the people who can now talk who couldn't talk, all the people who could hear who couldn't hear, all the people who are on their deathbeds that are now working again because he touched them and they were healed. All the people who his teaching touched. You can't tell me that the teaching of authority and power, which was something all the people marveled at, was not a sign from heaven that Jesus was the Messiah. On top of that, everything in his life fulfilled everything that God prophesied about the suffering Savior perfectly. And yet they had always wanted a sign from heaven. They wanted an indisputable sign. Well, they got one. They had one now, but such a one as signified the blinding of their eyes, the setting of the sun on them. It was a sign of the darkness that was come and coming upon the Jewish church and nation. And there was a darkness that came upon Israel in that day. They were doing their utmost to extinguish the sun of righteousness, which was now setting and the rising again, the rising again of which they would never own, and what then might be expected among them, but a worse than Egyptian darkness. This intimated to them that the things which belonged to their peace were now hid from their eyes. Isn't that a beautiful way of putting that? I mean, the way he just takes all of that and encapsulates it, uh, what Mark is saying in a very concise way, he just shows what's really happening, that there is significance in this darkness. Do you remember when he dies, something else happens. I think that comes up when we get to it next week, uh, but I'll just, we'll get a little bit ahead of ourselves, that when he dies, the veil in the temple is actually ripped in half. And that inner sanctum is never going to be the holy of holies ever again. Because God's spirit will not dwell in a temple made by the hands of men. His spirit now dwells in the people who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Something is changing and the darkness here is signifying the change. They were looking for a sign. They got one. It wasn't the sign they wanted. It's the sign of their rejection. That God is now rejecting them the way they have rejected him. And that, the day of the Lord was at hand. That's what this signifies. Which should be to them a day of darkness and gloominess. Joel 2.1 and Joel 2.2. 2. You really should go read Joel 2.1 and 2. So chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. Because it really talks about this. That this was the darkness that they had invited in. This was the darkness that they had embraced. And now it was covering them. It was the power of darkness that they were now under the works of darkness that they were now doing, and such as this should their doom justly be who loved darkness rather than light. You know, I don't think I've ever heard anybody put it that well. Um, what they had done in that moment when they cried out crucify him is they had ran away from their God 
and embraced Satan. They had rejected the light of the love of God, the mercy of God, and the grace of God, and had embraced the darkness of sin and death. And now God, in a very symbolic way, is shrouding them in darkness to signify that because they have rejected him, he has rejected them. You know, there's a lot of just amazing truth that the Bible as a whole, and sadly, very few people look at the Bible as one book. The Bible's not 66 books in my mind. The Bible is one book. God only used 40-some-odd authors so that nobody could accuse a man of making it up. It's like me and my pens, and my wife, she loves my pens because she has to order them for me. I use different colored pens for different things. I use black pens to write most of my general notes. I use red pens to and make extra notes in between. I use blue pens for illustrations and stories that I want to put into a sermon. I use a purple pen for, well, anything that I can't figure out the fits in the black, red, or blue category. Then I have green pens of two different colors that I use for oddball thoughts that pop into my head that I want to research later on. So those are for questions I want to ask and try to answer. Uh, I have a whole set of pens, and I, every pen has a use. I also have a whole set of markers for my whiteboard. Some of you have been in my office, haven't you? Nick, come, I don't think Nick's here tonight. Nick comes into my office just to see what's on my whiteboard. He spies on me. It's my stream of consciousness. And I have about 12 different colors of markers. And each marker means something in my head that means nothing in anybody else's head. But it makes sense to me. But everything on the whiteboard is my writing. But everything on the whiteboard is in a different color for a different purpose. You know why God used 40 plus authors to write scripture? They're like the colored pens on my whiteboard and the colored ink pens on my paper. It's all coming from the same source, but it all has a specific purpose. And I use the different colors to show the purpose. When God used these men to write his word, each one had a specific personality. He used those personalities and those men to write his word for specific purposes. But it has one author and it's one book. So when I read it from beginning to end, it should all fit together perfectly and it should all make sense. That's what I'm getting at. And when you read it that way, you'll find out that it does. And this darkness that is descending on Israel is a very significant darkness, just as the writer here is picking up on, because it goes all the way back into the Old Testament. And when they came out of the land of captivity, when they came out of Egypt and they got ready to enter the promised land, do you remember what God told them? He told them, he said, you can choose life, or you can choose death. I'm going to leave that to you to choose. But understand this, if you choose life, you'll receive life. You'll be blessed above all nations. But if you choose death, you will receive death. Jesus came, walked among them, and said, choose life. You know what they chose? They chose death. They were looking for a sign. They got their sign. It got dark. And if they had been smart, if they had actually read the book that their king gave them to read, they would have known in that moment that they had made the wrong choice. And they'll know really shortly after this that they made the wrong choice. Because he's pouring out his wrath on his son in this moment because his son has became our sin. But in a few years, he'll pour out his wrath on them for executing his son. Because they picked death when they should have picked life. They ran away from the light and ran straight into the darkness. God said, you pick. But once you pick, that's what I give. And the darkness is a foreshadowing of the death that is about to follow. And it followed. 
and he destroyed them as a people. You know why there's a remnant of the Jewish people? Two reasons. I was going to say one, but there's really two. One, God always keeps his promises. And he made a promise to their forefathers, not to those people, but to their forefathers, that he would keep a remnant of them alive. Number two, he's a God of grace. Those are the only two reasons there's any Jewish people left on this earth to this day. There wasn't very many of them left 30 or 40 years after the crucifixion of Jesus because he nearly extinguished them as a people. That's what the darkness is about. So, wow, that's dark, isn't it? There's a moral to this story. Don't choose death. Choose life. Don't reject Jesus. Embrace Jesus. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for another day you've blessed us with. We thank you for the word that you've given us. We thank you for the truth that we find there. Help us to embrace all of Scripture. Help us to understand that every bit of it is your word, that you did use men to write your word, but you used men that you inspired to write your word, and that you did use their personalities, but it was all done according to your purpose and plan to speak your truth into our lives. And so, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the word that you've blessed us with. And we do pray, as always, that as we read the word and study the word, your spirit would move in us and help us to understand and correctly apply what we come to understand as we study your word. And so, Father, we just pray that you would be with us, continue to guide us and direct us through the word. Father, we do pray tonight that you would watch over each one who's gathered here this evening, keep them safe as they travel home. Also, keep them in the center of your will this week. Uh, give them the courage and the strength they need to be faithful witnesses out there in the world in which they live, that they might seize the opportunities that you give them to share the gospel with someone who desperately needs to hear it. So, Father, we just pray your will be done in each one of our lives. Help us to live our lives in obedience to you as we seek to serve you in all ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For order a copy of today's message, call or write the address or phone number on the screen. Ask for your copy by giving the title and tape number of this message. Copies of today's message or any other messages may be ordered for $4 per audio CD, $15 for VHS or DVD. Please include the message title and tape number with your order. This has been Connecting Lives at Sunny Crest Baptist Church. If you live in or plan on visiting the North Central Indiana area, join us at Sunny Crest Baptist Church, located in Marion, Indiana. For more information, we invite you to visit us on the internet at www.sunnycrestbaptist.org. Connecting Lives Ministries has the vision of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Your prayers and support of any kind are greatly appreciated. To contact us, simply call 765 area code 664 3047 or write us today at the address shown on the screen. Until next time, thank you for joining us as we seek to connect lives to our Savior, Jesus Christ.